opportunity that you get to take this week if you take advantage of it. Today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Cochran from Wheaton College, and tomorrow you're going to be in, in advisement, and you'll be working through, watching a video, having time at different points in the video to work through a worksheet. It'll, it's a way of helping you to kind of understand who you are, where you belong, and what you're meant to do, so you can start this process of understanding what the good life is. And so I encourage you to take this opportunity. And so let us begin now with prayer. Jay Ali. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for gathering us here today to reflect on the importance of being human. Thank you for bringing Dr. Cochran to Westminster and for the words he will share with us. I ask that you help us use them as a daily reminder to always remain grounded in our moral values, even if it means enduring challenges. I pray that you further open our eyes to the beauty of being ourselves and lead us down a path that starts with compassion, respect, and love. As we continue to move through this holy week of prayerful meditation, help us to not rely entirely on external gratification as the source of our happiness, but rather let selflessness and the ability to offer a shoulder for others to lean on be what fuels us each and every day. In your name I pray, amen. Dr. Joey Cochran comes to Westminster from the Chicagoland area where he is the visiting assistant professor in the history department and the church historian of Wheaton College. Dr. Cochran graduated with his bachelor's in business administration from the University of Texas at Arlington. He moved on to Dallas Theological Seminary, earning a master of theology, and then moved to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School to complete his PhD. Before his academic career, Dr. Cochran worked in the churches in Oklahoma and Illinois he is currently the general editor and regular columnist of The Anxious Bench and works with the Conference on Faith and History. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joey Cochran to Westminster. First of all, I just wanna thank David and Westminster School, the staff and the faculty for already a, a very lovely time. You have a beautiful campus. Uh, I've got to meet a number of your students and your staff and it's, this is a, a very special place. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now the Holy Scriptures are full of all sorts of wisdom literature or maxims for living a skillful life or a good life. And for Christians, Jesus summed up what that looks like with the two great commandments. To love your God with all your heart, 
mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Yet, perhaps nowhere that I can think of in the New Testament provides the texture to the cost of living the good life according to this Christian tradition than here in what we refer to as the Beatitudes, which some have called the preamble to Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount. In these statements on the blessed or the happy life, we see two moves. There is a first segment of these maxims that remind us that life happens to us and that we are born in certain circumstances and live and survive in those circumstances. At some point in your life, all of these situations will likely apply to you. Perhaps more significantly is that when Jesus sat down on the mountainside to speak authoritatively on the good life, As they do that, Jesus later shares in a parable that it is as if they are doing those acts of mercy to him. With the maxim to hunger and thirst for righteousness and the one concerning mourning, we see a sense in which there is a communal aspect to the good life. We have obligations to others. We are called to be good neighbors and friends good daughters and sons, brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles, and perhaps will be called to be mothers and fathers. These obligations and responsibilities ground us in a place in time 
but they also give us a sense of a heritage, a memory that we are heirs of family lineage that brought us to our circumstances, and that we are members and citizens in a community or a nation that works to create a certain vision for society. Part of seeking the good life is a reminder that we have community and family obligations to fulfill. I could go on through each of these different maxims, but I believe I've made my point that we are born into certain circumstances. We have some level of agency in what we can do for our own life. And we have an obligation to be able to do something to not just have the good life ourselves, but that we ought to look to see how we can extend and expand the good life for others. But let me remind you of one other crucial aspect of what Jesus was doing on that mountainside when he offered his introduction to the greatest sermon ever preached in the Christian tradition. He was providing hints and teasers for what he had been doing and would continue to do as long as he lived his earthly life with his disciples. He would model for them each of these different maxims, and he would be the true fulfillment of all of them. Jesus would live the life of a beggar who didn't have a place to lay his head. He would depend upon others fully for his needs. He would demonstrate the gently and lowly life. And when Jesus wept upon the death of Lazarus, it would be a powerful and moving moment where the world would see and be gripped by how God is moved by the loss of life and what moves God is willing to make to restore life, to resurrect it. Not only would Jesus claim that when we feed the hungry and quench the thirsty, that we would be feeding him and offering him drink, but he would also claim at the Feast of Unleavened Bread that he is the bread of life and anyone who would feed off him would never go hungry. He would later say the same thing concerning thirst. He would cry out that he is the water of life, and anyone who would come to him would never thirst again. So as Jesus shared each of these secrets to the blessed life, he was hinting to his disciples that he was the secret that unlocked all the secrets that he was truly human and had come to live a truly human life. Jesus wanted his disciples to mimic him, to imitate him. He wanted them to curiously watch how he lived his life. And as they went through life together, he hoped that they would continue in their curiosity, asking and reflecting about what it meant to live life together. This was meant to move the disciples and inspire them, which is exactly what any good teacher wants for their students. Excellent teachers want students to be moved, to be inspired, and to imitate the teacher's example. I sit with students every week. We gather in the lecture hall or seminar rooms in Blanchard Hall at Wheaton College, and we reflect much of our time on what it means to have a philosophy of life. There's a lot of questioning and exploration involved in the process. As a historian, the mode that I teach my students is typically through storytelling. We look back upon past lives that have been lived, and we recount those lives to one another. I paint for them the context in which that person lived. I add textures to the picture by discussing the politics, the arts, the global events that occurred during that person's life. Students gravitate to certain lives that we discuss, and they begin to idealize those lives. They do the same thing with periods of history as well. They will look back at past circumstances and romanticize them. To be fair, I do a little bit of both myself. Together we see what those people did during their lives amidst the circumstances that they lived. And we assess how they acted as agents in the world. The stories stir up all sorts of questions that give us pause for reflection. I would say that a fair amount of the students treasure our time together. 
They don't take for granted the privilege that they have to sit in a classroom and spend time on reflecting about the past. On the other hand, there are times, as there are for any of us, where you can tell some students want to be somewhere else doing something else with their life, especially on the rare sunny afternoon in the midst of a harsh Chicago winter. On those occasions, a few students would rather be playing spike ball on the quad rather than engaging in the contemplative life. Undoubtedly, some have become a little bit impatient about the slow, methodical process that goes into reflecting about the good life. They want to get into class, get out of class, and go on to the next thing in life. And to be fair, there is something to be said about going out and living versus staying in and thinking about life. But there is also something to be said about living in the moment that you are in rather than living for the next moment of life. This semester, I'm facilitating a seminar on early U.S. personal narratives. Our seminar meets three times a week, and at each meeting, we discuss the life of a different person. The course scope covers from first colonial settlement until the Civil War. We've looked at all sorts of lives. Some lives you would know, like Ben Franklin. Other lives you would possibly never have heard of, such as Patience Boston. Ben Franklin would be someone that many in our modern era would say live the good life, coming from common origins through shrewdness, prudence, and industry. He became a successful printer, enlightened thinker, inventor, ambassador, and founding father of our nation. On the other hand, Patience Boston might be someone who lived the not-so-good life. From her native childhood, she found herself perpetually in indentured servitude. Every time she completed her indenture, she voluntarily re-indentured herself. Prone to drunkenness and lewdness, she confessed to drowning her master's son. Her prison, spiritual conversion narrative, and execution narrative is one of those stories that fills you with pity for the people who come from terrible circumstances. It also causes you to ask a lot of questions about systemic social structures and the limits people have in raising themselves up from their bootstraps, as they say. While those are just two examples of the narratives we have looked at, they give a solid sampling of the range of characters and stories our seminar has reflected on. I'd like to zero in on just one other narrative for you. One that I keep returning to because it is both inspiring and chastening to me. It causes me to step back and ask myself, what does the full texture of the good life look like? In a word, it looks like what Jesus says it does in the Beatitudes. It's a truly human life that is filled with all the human experiences. Phyllis Wheatley lived in a, a pronounced and protracted life despite its brief measure of 31 years. Many Americans recognize who she is because she is renowned as America's first African-American poet. Beyond that, few are familiar with her poems and correspondence, let alone the story of her auspicious rise and abrupt decline. A little girl of seven or eight years old arrived in Boston aboard a slave ship called the Phyllis on July 11, 1763. She had been enslaved in West Africa and survived the brutal transatlantic Middle Passage. Upon being purchased by John and Susanna Wheatley, she became a maidservant in the prominent merchant's Boston home. Quite frankly, she was no mere maidservant to the Wheatleys. John and Susanna had lost a daughter some years ago who would have been the very age of Phyllis. While officially in the status as a slave, Phyllis was raised more as an adopted daughter. When Susanna passed away in March of 1774, Phyllis elegized her as a mother and closest and dearest friend. 
The Wheatleys also had 18-year-old twins, Nathaniel and Mary. The daughter, Mary Wheatley, brought Phyllis under her tutelage, teaching her to be an African of letters. She learned English within 18 months and advanced in the coming years to learn history, sacred writings, classical literature, and some Latin. Phyllis channeled her education into her passion for composing poetry, which is what she is known for today. Phyllis likely heard George Whitfield preach at Old South Church during his last preaching tour of America in 1770. Even if not, we know certainly that Samuel Cooper baptized her in this church on August 18th, 1771. And prior to baptism, in the latter part of 1770, Phyllis wrote a beautiful elegy on the Great Awakening what revivalist Whitfield, which was published in both Boston and London newspapers shortly after his death. Wheatley sent a letter to Selina Hastings, the Countess of Huntington, dated October 25th, 1770, which enclosed a hand-drafted copy of her elegy of Whitfield, who was the Countess's chaplain. The successful publication of her poetic elegy on, of Whitfield, the letter to the Countess, and later correspondence with her prompted the Countess to sponsor a printed collection of Phyllis's poems and to invite her to England. Accompanied by her mistress, Susanna, and her young master, Nathaniel, Phyllis arrived in London and met lords, ladies, and other elites. She was introduced to a sophisticated and genteel society, no less than the great Greek philologist and abolitionist, Granville Sharp, accompanied her on a tour through some of the most historic sites in London. In July of 1772, a year prior to her visit, Lord Mansfield ruled in favor of an African slave from Boston, James Somerset, on a case that set a precedent for all slaves who sojourned to England. The ruling, popularly known today as the Somerset decision, protected a slave from being forced to return to their land of enslavement once they reached Freedom Shore in England. The foray to England for Phyllis may not have been happenstance. Rather, it might very well have served the role of a test case for the Somerset decision. Once in England, Phyllis did not have to return enslaved. Her mother, Susanna Wheatley, gave her the option to remain in England free from bondage. Not wanting to part with her mother, she elected to return to New England. Upon her return, her parents offered her freedom. Poems on various subjects, religious and moral, was published in 1773 from London. Over 300 copies were transported to New England and sold by Cox and Berry in Boston. Advertisements for subscriptions appeared in the Boston Censor, the Massachusetts Gazette, and the Boston Newsletter during 1772 and 73. Wheatley's first and only publication could be reserved at a subscription price that ranged from two to four shillings, depending on the bookseller, quality of paper, the type, and the binding of the text. The solitary likeness we have of Phyllis is due to the Countess's insistence that a frontispiece of Phyllis ought to be commissioned. This likeness of Phyllis appeared in the first and subsequent printings of her volume of poetry. Poems on various subjects was 86 pages in length and included 39 original pieces of poetry. Besides her elegy to Whitfield, other noteworthy poems included her first poem penned at age 15 to the University of Cambridge in New England, a poem of encouragement to Harvard University students. To the King's Most Excellent Majesty, 1770, 1768, a poem to George III after he revoked the Stamp Act. Goliath of Gath, a poetic recount of David slaying Goliath, and Niobe in distress for her children slain by Apollo, 
a poem derived from Ovid's epic Metamorphosis. Wheatley's poems were preceded with an endorsement from a council of leading Bostonian men. Eighteen ministerial, intellectual, and political leaders met with Phyllis and judged her rational and artistic capacity to produce poetry. Among this council were seven ordained ministers, three poets, six future loyalists, and several future revolutionaries. Almost all were Harvard graduates. Henry Louis Gates Jr. describes this meeting as a trial and asserts their interrogation of this witness and her answers would determine not only this woman's fate, but the subsequent direction of the anti-slavery movement, as well as the birth of what a later commentator would call a new species of literature, the literature written by slaves. The Countess's patronage, as well as the Bostonian literati's endorsement, influenced the short-term course of Phyllis Wheatley's New England life, launching her into the public eye as an artist, gentlewoman, and celebrity. By 1773, a decade after her enslavement, Phyllis had become a literate intellectual, the first published African-American woman, and a person who fluidly moved among the transatlantic elite of London and Boston society. However, it would not be long before her good life would experience a dramatic turn of circumstances. Now that she had returned from England and gained her freedom, she was on her own in the world. She had her earnings from her publications, and she had many fruitful social connections. She was even given some options and invitations for how she might choose to live her life. Both Samuel Hopkins and John Thornton, a pair of abolitionists who promoted recolonization in Africa, suggested to Phyllis that she marry one of the African missionary pastors who would recolonize and Christianize Sierra Leone. Phyllis politely declined this suggestion for her. Why? She saw herself as an American, and she had an ambition to live the good life in America, not just for herself, but to demonstrate that African people can have the good life in America. By 1778, she had moved to Queen Street in Boston and become engaged to a merchant, John Peters. The two married in November of that year. John, like Phyllis, had become a freed person, and like Phyllis, he was industrious and ambitious. For years, he had partnered with his previous master, Lieutenant John Wilkins of Middleton. John Peters' role in their business partnership was to bring all the product from the Wilkins plantation to market in Boston. John Peters maintained the books for the plantation and for his own mercantile in Boston that he had opened. As his previous master's health declined, John Wilkins decided to leave and probate his plantation to John Peters on the condition that John Peters saw to the good and health of Wilkins's widow, Naomi. In March of 1780, Naomi deeded over two parcels of land to John Peters, making Peters the owner of a plantation of over 150 acres. By April of 1780, John and Phyllis Wheatley Peters resided in the big house of the old Wilkins plantation in Middleton. They had a fine table, bed, sitting room with an ample library, their own entertainment space, and their own servants. They attempted to move about society in Middleton, socializing with their neighbors and other noteworthy citizens. They would even attempt to play host for these folks in their large home. John Peter's success as a businessman would have been a topic of conversation at these social engagements, but Phyllis, the famous published African poet who had traveled to, La to London, no doubt would be the center of every social engagement. By all means, they had attained the good life as a respectable and genteel family of some means. Nonetheless, others in the Middleton community did not like their presence in the town and what that symbolically meant for their society. Various men throughout the community began to litigate against John Peters, taking him to court repeatedly 
concerning their ownership of the plantation and concerning his varied business interests. Frankly, they did this because he was a successful black freedman and they wanted what he had achieved. From the spring of 1781 through 1783, John Peters battled in court over the right to his land. He experienced losses in the amount of 51 pounds in damages, 75 pounds in taxes, and 50 pounds in court fees. That would roughly be around a quarter of a million dollars in today's currency. Due to these severe losses, he ended up in debtor's prison in 1784. In addition to these business afflictions, in June of 1783, John and Phyllis lost an infant child. Phyllis had sold most of their worldly belongings. She managed to hang on to a manuscript draft for another published work of her poetry and a gift edition of Milton's Paradise Lost, which had been given to her by Lord Dartmouth. Otherwise, all of her other worldly belongings had to be given up for John's upkeep in debtor's prison. Since they had lost their plantation, Phyllis and her second infant now lived in Boston, not far away from debtor's prison. And Phyllis worked as a scullery maid. The conditions of their little apartment were terrible, as well as their diet. As a brutally cold winter swept through Boston in 1784, Phyllis Wheatley Peters succumbed to a terrible illness and died. Days later, her infant died as well. John Peters was given release to stand in the prison yard and look on at the funeral procession of his beloved wife. He later was released from prison. He attempted to recover her manuscript of poetry and bring it to publication. But sadly, the manuscript had been misplaced. It's never been found. The combined life of Phyllis and John Peters is a reminder that the good life looks like different things to different people. Their story is a reminder that our lives have good parts and they have difficult parts. There are high points of achievement, like when Phyllis published her poetry and traveled to London, or John acquired the plantation. But if our lives are truly human lives, they will be marked by misfortune and loss too. They will be lives that involve grief and mourning. They will be lives that require us to exercise gentleness and lowliness, despite how terrible others might treat us. Our circumstances will change, and we will be required to determine how we will respond to those circumstances. The good life is not just about achieving some good end, it's about living a fully and truly human life until we are faced with the prospect of achieving a good death. And a good death is the opportunity for our loved ones and neighbors to gather and remember the good life we lived moment by moment, day by day. All of this is part of developing our philosophy of life. We are all required to reflect upon how now we shall live. And we have to consider how now we shall live with one another. Our society is at a bit of a crossroads where we have to look back and consider, do we want to live like the people of Middleton or do we want to live like John and Susanna Wheatley? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cochran, and thank you for putting up with our power outage in the middle of your talk. And it's so good to hear a particular story about what the good life means in its ups and its downs, not just to think about it theoretically, but to see it as an individual lived it. Tomorrow, you will be working on this in advisement, and I hope that you will be prepared to really dive in deeply so that you can understand who you are, where you belong, and what you're meant to do. We will see you tomorrow. You are dismissed.